for your general linear reviews of algebra. Thank you, and thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, as I said, on some results on Milpa's orbit for GLMN. Um, so feel free to tell me if I'm not talking loud enough, because I know that I can talk kind of quiet, but maybe this is a small enough room, it'll be okay. But if I need to speak up, just let me know. Um, so the outline of the talk, I have a couple of sections. Uh, the first one is some joint work with Dan and Kano on the milpotent cones for classical, simple, weak super algebras. I'll be kind of brief there uh, because I mostly want to focus on GLMN. Uh, so we'll get some results for the milpotent orbit in that case. And then there's some uh, connections with sign young diagrams I wanted to mention, especially since I think the theme of the talks are kind of some combinatorics. So maybe that'll um, bring some of that flavor into the talk. So the conventions today, everything will be over C. Um, and G will always be a connected reductive algebraic group. So I'd like to start off kind of simple, basic, hopefully, um, and just state what a least super algebra is, make sure we're all on the same page. So this is just going to be a Z mod 2Z graded algebra that comes with a bilinear map and a super bracket that satisfies uh, graded or super versions of your usual Z bracket axiom. So it respects the grading, um, we have this anti-commutativity, and we have an analog of the Jacobi identity, the super Jacobi identity, where all these coefficients um, are just respecting the grading, right? So the, the bars around the elements here are the degree of the elements. So these rules are for homogeneous elements, so then you would extend linearly. Um, you know, for today, you're free to think about the bracket as being the analog of the commutator, it'll just be the super commutator. Okay, so x, y minus negative one to the product of the degrees of x and y times y, x. And we'll be focusing on the adjoint action, um, where when I say adjoint action, I'm thinking of the odd part, g1, in the grading as being a g0 module. So then I can have this map that goes from the even part to zero, where I send it to the map that's bracket with x. So that's an endomorphism on the odd part. And we'll be focused on GLMN. Um, so I like to think of this very concretely in terms of matrices. So these will be M plus N by M plus N matrices. You can write them out in this nice block form. Um, so A will be M by M, D will be N by N, and B and C will be rectangular of the appropriate size. And then you can have these identifications as Lie algebra, <laughs> where G0 will be GLM directs on GLN. And then capital G0 would be the corresponding general, general linear groups of GLM cross GL. And then we can describe the adjoint action, where here I'm thinking about G0 doing the acting as our usual matrix conjugation, but just in this block form. So A and B are invertible matrices of size M and N, respectively. And then I just conjugate acting on um, some odd element in G1. Then we have this nice formula where you can compute things pretty easily. Okay, so now with this action, um, what we're going to be doing is looking for the nilpotent elements, right? So in, in classical Lie theory, a very common object to study is the nilpotent cone. And in that setting, you can uh, interpret the nilpotent cone, one characterization of it, is as the zero locus of some invariant polynomial. So here we're going to define the nilpotent cone for least super algebras in a similar way. So I'm going to be taking the zero locus here of the S of G1 star G0 invariant. Okay, so I'm taking the symmetric algebra on G1 star, acting on it by the adjoint action that we gave on the previous page with G0, and taking those invariants. And the plus here means that I just want a zero constant term. And then we explicitly write that out uh, on the right hand side. Um, now this is similar to something that Katz did in 1980, where he defined what are called nil varieties in a slightly more general setting. Instead of Z mod 2Z grading, he was looking at Z graded Lie algebras. Um, in fact, our definition though was you know, more motivated or also motivated by this work of Bo, Kujawa, and Nakano um, using these detecting subalgebras. And these detecting subalgebras were defined using analogs of semi-simple elements. 
And in that situation, they got this nice picture where we have all these isomorphisms of this relative Lee super algebra cohomology and these, uh, these uh, polynomial rings on the bottom, mm -hmm. S of G something invariant. So all the semi-simple stuff is showing up over here in this corner. And then you see the thing that we're working with down here in the bottom left-hand corner. And I should mention that you know, if you cover up the one and the zero and you just say S of G star G invariance, that's the classical Lie algebra to solve for it. The Lie cohort super. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, to understand why you, why the new one cloning elements in the alpha? That's a good question. So, um, one reason is that, you know, we're, our definition of adjoint action is looking at G0 and G1, so I'm only looking at G1. You could uh, define this as being like the odd null cone and think about a more general nil potent cone, but then you would need to bring in a super group, I guess, right? So I, um, I haven't really thought about it in that perspective. Other questions? Okay, and then maybe I could say, yeah, but the other reason is this picture, right? <laughs> <laughs> if, you want, if you want to symbolize it, it's this picture, as well as the other one. Um, so our first main result for GLMN uh, under the situation was to look at the number of, of orbits of G0 on N, and uh, it turns out that those are finite, just like in the classical case, and we were able to give a complete set of orbit representatives very explicitly. This is nice for calculations, because you can just work with these matrices. They don't look that nice, but over time they've grown on me, because I work with them more often, and if you actually parse out what these representatives look like, um, your matrices are just filled with zeros and ones, okay? So let me say a little bit more about the structure of that representative. So what are all these things showing up, all these parameters? So the I's are just identity matrices. Um, and Y plus, in case you missed it on the last slide, Y plus is like the upper right block, Y minus is the lower left block. Okay, so Y plus is a really easy form, and Y minus is slightly more complicated. Uh, you split it up into these Jordan blocks in the upper left. They all have zero eigenvalues. Um, and then you have these sort of column and row echelon form ish matrices and the other block, and then an identity matrix down there in the bottom. So that's what all of this is saying, okay? But if you're actually working with this, um, like in an example, you can see that it's not that, not that bad, right? It's very, uh, very helpful and useful to work with. So like in GL33, here's a Milfoot Norbert representative. Here's my Y plus block um, that has a two by two identity matrix in it. And then Y minus down here, that's a single Jordan block of size two. The C and the R part that the column and row echelon form, those are just zero. And then I have a one by one identity matrix there. So you can encode all this information in, um, in these parameters. Okay. Um, if I have time, I may say something about the proof, but I, I think I think it'll be okay if I don't, <laughs> unless someone has a has a question about it. Um, okay, so you know, mostly I'm going to focus on GLMN, but I did want to pause here just to say that we used that result to go from GLMN to all classical simple Lie super algebras. So you can define the nil potent cone in the same way, and then you can use this result um, where you embed G here, which is now some other. Uh, uh, simple classical Lie super algebra. You embed it in a GLMN with this complement M that satisfies this condition that it's un, uh, invariant under bracketing with G. So when you can do that, um, then all of your big orbits break up into finitely many small orbits. And since you only have finitely many big GLMN orbits, you get finitely many orbits for all the all the others as well. Okay, that's what the, the, the second result is saying. There was a little bit of work here. It wasn't quite as simple as just saying, oh, a complement exists. We had to actually construct these because unlike in the classical case where you have a similar kind of uh, setup with this complement, it's called a, a Richardson theorem. There you kind of get complete reducibility or you get the complement for free because of complete reducibility. Here you didn't always have that, uh, have that. So we had to 
uh, construct some of these case by case. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now going back to GLMN, uh, now that we know we have finite domain orbits, you might say, what does the centralizer look like? You know, what kind of geometric results do you have? So in order to um, compute these centralizers, similar to how we define the representatives by working block by block, we did the same thing for the centralizer. Look at the centralizing conditions block by block. And here's where the idea of the proof was helpful because the proof was um, long, but only used elementary linear algebra techniques and one, um, one special fact about the generating polynomials um, for the corresponding ideals of the zero locus, but mostly, you know, we have to carefully work through all this linear algebra, and if you go through that construction, you actually construct the centralizers along the way, so that was pretty nice. And then you get a formula that's not so nice. <laughs> There it is, in terms of our parameters. Um, again, it's grown on me over, over time because you can kind of pull out where each one of these uh, pieces come, comes from, so maybe I won't read off the whole thing. I don't think that would help anybody, but you know, if you look at this first part, this is gonna come from the Jordan form uh, block, and then if you look at you have, uh, here, you have something with an M minus R, and here's something with an N minus R and an R2, so that, conceivably could come from the C and the R, and then the last thing is the IS. So you, again, each one of these things just comes out of looking at those centralizing conditions there. And a lot of linear algebra, a lot of multiplying matrices. Um, okay, and then besides the dimension, it's also not hard to show that uh, the centralizers are connected. And this was uh, similar to the way you showed the centralizers of a notebook in orbit for a Lie algebra are connected. You realize it as, um, an open subset of some affine space, you know, so it's irreducible and connected. So there's nothing too uh, deep needed there. And again, the, the nice thing that I like about this is you can write out what the centralizer is very explicitly if you need to do calculations. So like for our same representative from earlier, the centralizer would look like this. And when you work this out, you can again match up and say, oh, you know, Oh look, this looks like something that centralizes the Jordan block of size two. And then I have these zeros here in these positions. And let's see where the other ones are at. These positions um, that come from the C and the R. And then the fact that this entry and this entry are the same come from this IS being size one down here. So these all have nice, easy interpretations. And you can just count the dimensions. You can just stare at it and see Oh, I have five different elements. My dimension of my centralizer is five. And the orbit will therefore have dimension 13. One thing that's kind of interesting is that just from this simple example, you see that the dimensions of the orbits aren't even, which is which is uh, something that's different than the ordinary Lie algebra case, where the dimensions of no-load orbits are always even. Mm -hmm. Here they don't have to. But you're looking at odd points, so you have to uh, not, not necessarily. You can have, you can have some. I mean, that would be that would be fun if it was true, right? But, uh, but yeah, so they could be even or odd. Because the dimension of of uh, you know, GL three three is even. Right? It's even. Okay. Um, right. And so some other you know geometric results you get out of this. You have regular orbits, but. Um, again, it's not quite the same as the Lie algebra case. You have two different situations. If N and M are different, then you still just have one unique um, regular orbit mm -hmm. and you can compute its maximal dimension directly, 2MN minus N. Um, here I'm assuming N is less than or equal to M if you want to be, you, know, yeah, you could replace that by minimum or something. So 2MN minus the minimum of N and M. And then if they're equal, you have two uh, regular orbits of the same size, 2N squared minus N. Again, they have nice description in terms of the identity matrices in the Jordan form. So when they're equal, what are your two options? You could either put um, an identity block in the upper right corner and Jordan in the lower left, or vice versa, right? just swap them out. If M is less than M, then you do the best you can. You put the largest identity possible in the upper right-hand corner and then the largest Jordan block possible in the lower left-hand corner. And you could do that, kind of, uh, you could do that as 
you know, projecting from some case for n is equal to something down onto the small case by that. Here's an example of those. Four, three, three, there's our two regular orbits. So we see we have an identity matrix of size three and a Jordan block of size three. That's all zero eigenvalues. Now you might object to the O reg prime and say, Andy, that's not one of your representatives, but it's conjugate. It's not too hard to show that it's conjugate. I'm going to interrupt that out for you. And then if you want to say what happens when n is not equal to m, here you can see where you just cut off the last column and row, and that gives you the regular orbit for GL32. And then we can use the regular representatives to compute the irreducible components. So again, we have one if n and m are different, if two of the same dimension, if n equals m. Um, and as a kind of corollary to this, you get that uh, n is a complete intersection in the algebra. Row. And the, those uh, irreducible components are the closures of the regular order. But it's easy to see in the n less than m case because it is the largest one up there. Um, and then in the second case, you have a little work to do where you have to describe um, your, your zero locus, the ideal corresponding to that using those polynomials I alluded to earlier. So it turns out that you look at, um, so this might be familiar if you think about nilpotent matrices. If the matrix is nilpotent, then the trace of all the powers right, are, are zero. So here it's not the matrix, but it's the product of the two matrices. And then you can show that you can replace the highest power by the uh, determinant of the product, or any factor of the determinant, in order to get your two mm -hmm. sub varieties. Um, okay. okay. So the other thing I wanted to mention, um, a little different for those of you that seen some of this before. Um, there's a connection to sine Young diagrams with these no plug orbits. So there's the classical result. You're just looking at GLN, and if you take a partition of N, which has a Young diagram of N, then you can write out the no plug orbit corresponding to that partition, right? And all you do is use the Jordan form. So you can use the Jordan form of the matrix, great. Look at the size of the block. So you can do something analogous here, but you need extra information. What do you need? You need signs. Okay. Not that, you know, if you think about it for a minute, I've graded the two pieces, so I need two kind of decorations right, to distinguish things. Um, so, so we use these sign Young diagrams, and what are those? If it has a signature MN, we take first just a Young diagram of size M plus N, and then we label the boxes with pluses or minuses, um, M pluses, N minuses, and the rules are that pluses and minuses have to alternate within a row, and then if you interchange rows of the same size, we call those diagrams equivalent. So I wrote out the three possibilities for two here, right? So you don't just have a single Young diagram. If you put signs on it, you have three possibilities. And what Kraft and Percezzi showed in a paper in 1979 is a bijection between these sign Young diagrams and what they call nilpotent pairs. And it turns out that the action that they use for the nilpotent pairs is exactly the adjoint action of G0 on G1. Mm -hmm. So it seems like if you just translate it correctly, you should be able to have a bijection between uh, the sine Young diagram and our nilpotent orbit. And you can do that by looking at the root system. Um, so if you look at simple odd roots, so for GLMN, that's just epsilon i's minus delta j's um, plus or minus, where the epsilons correspond to the, the m's Right, the first blocks and the deltas correspond to the others, the n plus ones to n. Um, and then you can write off the corresponding root vectors, our elementary matrices. Then you have this nice way to move between an orbit representative and a sine Young diagram. So here's the same matrix that we have worked with throughout the talk. If I label here, um, so I don't know if it'll show up if I write on this or not, I'll just try it. Can we go? Oh yeah, great. Okay, so here's my epsilons, and here are my deltas. So 
So you can see that we have the root vectors for epsilon one delta one, uh, epsilon two delta two, delta one epsilon two, and delta three epsilon three. Yep. And then we see that they kind of occur in these chains, right, or these sequences. And so if you lose the indices, if you identify ones where you have a minus and a plus, right, so they occur in a sequence, then you can write out these epsilon delta sequences, which is something people do with least bit algebra to describe uh, what are called fundamental systems, kind of the analog to phases. Then you can uh, split up these sequences that alternate between epsilons and deltas into some subsequences, and they correspond to the rows of your sine Young diagram. Right, so you have a straightforward kind of algorithm to go from one to the other. So why is the shape of plus four? Um, so this is GL three three, so three plus three is six. And then why is it four <laughs> two specifically? Um, it's a good question. It's because if you follow the chain here, where it's say you start at epsilon one, you know, delta one showing up, and then you look and say, do I have any other delta ones? And you say yes, right? So then you have epsilon, delta, epsilon, delta, and then delta two doesn't appear. So that's where the chain of four comes from. Another way to think about it is you're writing it as a sum of root vectors, right? And you have these two kind of pieces of the sum. Does that make sense? Um, other questions? Okay, so then this is my next to last slide. So I just wanted to show a nice fun picture where you can write out everything for GL22. Um, first off, it has a hardest thing, that's great. It has a nice hard shape. Because we all love math, we all love representation, so that's nice. Um, Right, but, uh, but you can also get a lot of information out of this, like this taxi diagram, right? So we see the regular orbits popping out at the, at the top, as you would expect. But now you can you know, work over here to start with. With the Young diagram, it's a lot simpler to write out um, your taxi diagram and then translate it back over to your um, no fuzz orbits and observe you know, if you have these pairs showing up or you can. Uh, Compared dimensions, you can also see you have two minimal orbits, like in this example. So you can get a lot of information by going back and forth between these two. And I feel like I have something else I want to say before we have to go. Okay, so maybe just to finish, um, what are some obvious future things to do? Well, this is all for type A. What about the other types? Do you have a classification for the no fuzz orbits? That would be nice to have because. The, the thing that let us do everything in the talk today was the fact that for type A, I had those explicit representatives I could work with, right? For these other types, we don't we don't have that. We just know there's finitely many orbits. So if you had something maybe concrete to work with, that would be nice for this, uh, for working with these other types. And then you could extend these results from GLMN to all the other types in some kind of unified way. So that you're not just doing it piecemeal, case by case, but you take your type A results and just extend or restrict down to the, the other types you know, that are some going on in a unified way. That'd be nice too. Okay. Thank you all for this. Do we have any questions for our speaker? Um, I'm wondering if this can be applied to some sort of stringer fiber kind of stuff. Like you it's a great flag, and then but it maybe has to be a partial flag because then you have odd things. That's a great question, and it's something that I would like to think about, but I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know if anyone has done that yet. And it seems like you should be able to, kind of in a straightforward way, you know, have an analog of a Springer resolution, right? So then you should be able to look at the fibers, but I don't know how it would differ. Something interesting to think about for sure. I almost put that on here as a future, a future <laughs> thing to think about, but I want to do it too. Any other questions? So he also wrote theorem U of Hilda A, but that's all you put that on? Or what happens if A to be wrote that on? Uh, you mean for which part? For, yeah, for, for like for the picture or just for the correspondence? 
So most of the theorems had the have two cases for that reason. So maybe if you're, are you talking about the sine Young diagram? Because you, you can still no, do I that. Think it's a default, default is, is yeah, it has. yeah, so it, for most of these, if n and m are different, then you have a, a unique object of whatever the object is. Does that answer your question? Or was there a specific? Then you keep going back. It is important, right? If they're, if they're different, then things are somehow more complicated, but also, but also easier. <laughs> There's usually a unique one of the things. If, if, if they're equal, everything kind of splits in half, and that's just kind of paired from 